Today's episode is brought to you by AG1. Visit drinkag1.com slash Kendall Ray to get a year's supply of vitamin D3K2 drops plus five travel packs for free with your first order. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to True Crime with Kendall Ray. I am so happy to have you here. Thanks for joining me to discuss yet another case. And if you are new, then welcome. Be sure to hit subscribe. So before I jump into today's case, I wanted to quickly mention my neck mech collection. As you guys know, I have partnered with the lovely folks at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And last month, I got the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and get a tour of their headquarters from their CEO, Michelle Delon. I got to meet so many amazing members of their team who are so passionate about the work that they do. And so many of them were wearing our neck mech merch, which was really, really cool. And I learned so much about the scope of their work and they truly do so much more than people even realize. So I wanted to start highlighting some of their lesser known projects. I know many of you out there are parents or child serving professionals and NECMEC provides a variety of safety and prevention resources that can be useful to you. One of the programs that I learned about while I was there that I wanted to highlight today is Kid Smarts. This is a child safety program that educates families about preventing abduction and empowers kids in grades K through five to practice safer behaviors. This program offers resources to help parents, caregivers, and teachers to protect kids by teaching and practicing the four rules of personal safety using classroom lessons, at home lessons, parent tips, and fun printable activities. For more information about Kid Smarts, you can visit the link in my description box. It's a really cool program. And when I was learning about it, I just knew I wanted to mention it in an upcoming video because I think it's a very useful resource for many of you out there. And it's programs like this that your donations to NECMEC are funding. So thank you so very much. If you would like to support our NECMEC campaign, you can do so by buying one of my merch items. It's all available at milehiremerch.com and 100% of the proceeds is donated directly to NECMEC. Today, I am wearing our crimson red crew neck. I love Love this one. I love a good crew neck for fall. Who doesn't? We do also have our green long sleeve. Love that color. It's one of my favorite colors. Although we have very limited quantities of that one left, we do also have our purple long sleeve and our green t shirt. Also, while you're there, if you want to support the show, you can check out our TCKR merch. Right now, we have four items available. Three of them have my logo embroidered on them. I love embroidery, so I had to go with that. And we also have my 10-year anniversary crew neck, which we will be pulling from the site soon. So if you want to get your hands on it, now is the time. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's case. So the case I'm going to be telling you about today takes place in Lafayette, Indiana, where a man named Ron Wiles was living and working. As you guys know, I do my best to learn as much as I can about the people I talk about in my content because I think it's truly important that we know the victim as much as we possibly can. However, in this case, the information about Ron's life, at least his early life, was very, very limited. Now, I will say, based on what I do know about Ron, it's not totally surprising that he sort of lived life under the radar. Ron was a very chill guy. He lived a quiet and honest life. He graduated from community college in Indiana in 1987, and by 1993, he started his own lawn care business called Ron's Lawns. And while this might sound kind of mundane, Ron lived a very full and purposeful life. He was known by everyone to be extremely kind and generous. That is one thing that everyone I've heard talk about Ron has said is he was generous. Ron's Lawns was not only a chance for him to do the work he loved, but he saw the bigger picture. It was a chance for him to employ people who were down on their luck. Ron was a big believer that people deserve a second, third, sometimes fourth or fifth chance in life. And if he could give them that opportunity, he would. And he did. And I don't know the exact number of people that Ron helped, but I know he helped a lot of people. And those people only ever spoke highly of him. They, again, said he was kind and generous, but also that he was loyal and forgiving. Ron was the kind of person that maintained lifelong friendships because of his loyalty, and I think that really says a lot about someone's character. Now, aside from Ron's lawns, he also was a property owner and a landlord. He actually had upwards of 12 properties that he owned and rented out 
which I imagine kept him pretty busy. But I do want to be clear that even though Ron was known as a very generous man, he was also not a pushover. I've heard his friends describe him as someone who says it like it is. And if someone was living in one of his properties and not paying rent, Ron wasn't going to let them just live there for free. So everything in his life was going well up until everything came crashing down in April of 2019. At 6.12 a.m. on Sunday, April 7th, 2019, a frantic 911 call came into dispatch made by a man named Thomas Day to report that shots had been fired. And during this very hectic call, his voice sounded weak and terrified as he told the dispatcher that he wasn't the one who was shot, but that he had been stabbed. Lafayette Police, 911. Yes, ma'am. Uh, shot fired. Shot fired. Somebody hit? Yes, ma'am. Somebody got shot? Yes, ma'am. Did somebody shoot you? Yeah, I'm not to stab me. You're stabbed? Yes, ma'am. Did somebody hit you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is the person there that did it? Yes, ma'am, I think so. Where are they at? Who is it? I don't know. Where's the person that stabbed you? Whoa. And obviously, as a dispatcher, that is a lot of information to take in. But then it got even more confusing because he started yelling, fire, fire, fire. Because right at that moment, he noticed that the house was up in flames. Fire, fire, fire. Fire. What? Fire. Okay, what's that noise going off? Are you still there? All units were dispatched to the scene, and among the first to arrive were a handful of police officers. And when they got there, they immediately saw just how serious this fire was. I mean, it wasn't just a small fire in one part of the house. The whole house was in flames. And until firefighters arrived, they really couldn't go inside just because of how bad the smoke was. At this point, they knew whoever got shot was still inside, but getting to them would not be easy. The officers did try to enter the house through a side door in hopes of recovering the person inside from a different point of entry, but after a few minutes of calling out with no response, they were forced to exit because of the smoke. And even if firefighters were just a few minutes behind, every second counted, and officers basically just had to wait for the fire to be put out before re-entering the house. Eventually, the fire was put out, and it ended up being the firefighters who broke the news to police that the one person still inside the house had sadly not survived. And as you probably already guessed, this person was 61-year-old Ron Wiles. Ron's body was found unresponsive in the back room of his house, and he had been shot several times. Now, it has been determined that these gunshot wounds were his cause of death, and it wasn't the fire. The fire was determined to have been set intentionally with the use of an accelerant. And right off the bat, I'm talking that morning, investigators had some theories about what happened based on the crime scene itself. They saw that Ron's pants pockets had been turned inside out, his wallet was a few feet away from him, completely emptied, and several drawers had been left open and appeared to have been rummaged through. And from that information, it's very obvious that this wasn't just a murder, it was a robbery. And the initial theory based on this alone was that this was a robbery gone wrong, meaning that the person who killed Ron had only intended on robbing him, but things escalated and got out of hand. And Thomas, the man who called 911, had been stabbed 29 times, absolutely brutal. And investigators believed that it was a situation where he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, that the intruder panicked when he came in and he was a casualty to this situation. Luckily, he didn't end up actually being a casualty. He did survive after being stabbed 29 times, which is pretty remarkable. But obviously, the whole situation seems really chaotic for there to be one person who was shot, one person who was stabbed, and the whole house to be set on fire. And obviously, one of the first things investigators wanted to do was talk to Thomas, but he was still receiving critical care that morning, and they weren't sure if he was going to survive, so they knew they had to talk to him quickly. And luckily, they were able to while he was still in the hospital, he told them the full story to the best of his ability. First, he explained his connection to Ron, that he was his roommate and his landlord. And then he went into the details of what he remembered happening that morning. In his statement, he said that sometime around 6 a.m., he was woken up to the sound of what he thought 
were firecrackers going off in the house. And obviously, that's a very startling and disturbing noise to wake up to at 6 a.m. And he was very confused. So he opens the bedroom door, and that's where he says he saw an intruder pointing a gun at Ron. And his first instinct is to charge at the guy. He wants to protect his roommate and friend, Ron, so he jumps on this dude, and the two of them start fighting. And during this struggle, the intruder drops the gun. However, the two of them continue to fight, and suddenly he starts feeling what he thought was the intruder punching him really, really hard, but he was actually being stabbed. Once he realizes that this man has a knife and is stabbing him 29 times, he is able to get away from him and he crawls back into his bedroom and that's where he makes the 911 call. And in the time that it took for him to reach his phone and make that call, he hears one more gunshot and then the sound of what he described as whooshing, which we now know was the sound of the intruder pouring accelerant over the house and then starting a fire. And of course, investigators had to consider the possibility that maybe Thomas was lying to them. But once they saw the extent of his injuries, realized that he had been stabbed 29 times and heard the story right from him, they knew that there is no way he was responsible for this. I mean, it would take a truly sick individual to stab themselves 29 times. So with Thomas off the table as a suspect, they had to go back to square one. Who would want to kill Ron Wiles and why? So we received a call last Sunday uh, from a male that stated he had been stabbed and also the house was on fire. That man was identified as Thomas Day. is still hospitalized. They found another victim inside that was suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, that person was identified as Ron Wiles. Wiles' brother-in-law, Chuck Justice, was hard at work Friday. We're still in shock. I mean, it was Sunday, but uh, and today is what Friday, and it's overwhelming. Uh, we just can't, we can't believe it. So Ron was a likable guy. Everybody loved him. Friends have been stopping by every day, wanting to, uh, you know, give me their condolences. So, uh, and he would do anything for anybody. Uh, he was a very, very nice guy. He'd give you a shirt off his back. Police here in Lafayette know what happened here at this house. What they don't know is why. And back at the crime scene, other investigators were collecting whatever evidence they could. But that's the thing about fires. They can easily wipe out valuable evidence. And I'm talking DNA, fingerprints, the things that they would need to tie someone conclusively to a murder. At the scene, they were able to collect spent bullet casings, Ron's emptied wallet, a knife, and a pair of headphones. And if you're thinking that the headphones seem kind of random... I mean, you're not wrong. They seemed a little random to me, too. But the thing is, these weren't just a pair of headphones inside the house. They were actually found outside by Ron's truck. So they collected them as evidence. Now, these become important later. And that was pretty much it in terms of physical evidence. And they certainly didn't find a smoking gun, so to speak. So their next step was to go and talk to neighbors. And people who live nearby were asked to check their home security footage to see if there was anything suspicious in the hours leading up to Ron's murder. And they were told that the person responsible was armed and likely dangerous, so they needed to be extra careful. Unfortunately, no one had seen anything suspicious on their home security footage. But one thing that a lot of these neighbors kept telling investigators is that they had their car recently broken into or someone they knew had recently had their car broken into. And two of these neighbors in particular were of interest to investigators because, first of all, one of them said that when his car was broken into, that someone stole two handguns out of it. And one of these guns was the type of gun that they believed was used to kill Ron Wiles. The other neighbor they spoke to said that they stole an ashtray that had some change in it and also his grandfather's watch. And while that may seem much less significant than two handguns being stolen, it actually ended up being the most helpful lead because this person actually knew who had broken into their car. And that man was Chris Johnson. This neighbor tells police that he actually saw Chris lurking around the area the day before his car was broken into. And he figured if Chris was dumb enough to steal his watch, he was likely dumb enough to try and pawn it off online. And that's exactly what he did. This neighbor knew that the person who broke into his car was Chris because he went online and looked for his watch. He went to his Facebook page directly, and this guy was trying to sell his watch from his personal 
Facebook page right after he had stolen it. Now, he did end up getting the watch back from Chris's girlfriend, but that story is sort of besides the point. So by that point, investigators are pretty confident that this Chris Johnson guy was responsible for breaking into the cars in the area and that he was responsible for stealing the ashtray, the change, the watch, and also the two guns. And that makes them start thinking that maybe Chris Johnson was responsible for the murder of Ron Wiles if the gun that was stolen is the same type of gun that was used to kill him. And keep in mind, this is all happening pretty quickly. I mean, within a day or two of Ron's murder, they are already calling Chris a suspect and starting their search for him. And the more they looked into him, the more and more possible it seemed that he was responsible for Ron's murder. Not only had Chris previously worked for Ron, but investigators learned that things ended between them on pretty bad terms because Chris owed Ron money. Not to mention the fact that Chris had a criminal record and he just sort of seemed capable of committing the crime. If Chris owed him money and Ron was robbed that night, then the shoe fits. But the shoe didn't end up fitting. Because when Chris was found and brought in for questioning, he was genuinely, genuinely devastated to hear that Ron had been murdered. He was shocked. Despite their falling out, Chris knew Ron to be an incredibly good guy and said that under no circumstances would he ever have killed him. I mean, he could barely wrap his head around what detectives were telling him. I'm going to play a quick clip from his interrogation so that you guys can see his reaction for yourself. So with that being said, and again, this is just part of my job, but you didn't have anything to do with the fire. You wouldn't have hurt no, Ron. No, never heard him. He's dead. You wouldn't have hurt him in any way with any type no, of weapon or anything like that? No, he's doing nothing like that. Okay. Oh. He wasn't a bad dude. He always helped me to my whole life. Do you know anybody that would have wanted to hurt him or, or see him? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh my God. That's what we're trying to figure out here, Chris. So if you have any. He was a good dude. In my opinion, his reaction seems to be honest. He seems like he's really in pain and sad to hear that Ron was no longer alive. And of course, people lie, especially when they're being accused of murder, but the detective felt inclined to believe him. And she was right to do so because Chris ends up naming two people that he thinks would want Ron dead. And it was because of him giving them that lead that they ended up finding Ron's true killer. During his interrogation, Chris named someone that I'm going to call Mike, which isn't his real name, but that's besides the point. He also mentioned someone named Andrew Alcorns. And he said that both of these men were known to have issues with Ron in the last few months. But Andrew's issues with Ron or his beef with Ron was much more recent, like within the last week recent. So investigators figure either of these men could have been responsible. So they start tracking them down. So Mike was found first. And when they found him, he had actually just been arrested and was at the hospital. And when they interviewed him, just like Chris, he only had good things to say about Ron and was pretty shocked to hear about his death. And he said, sure, they had issues, but Ron was someone who helped him get back on his feet during a really hard time. And just like Chris, he said he would never harm him. But also like Chris, he said that they should really look into Andrew Alcorn's. And then he tells them that Andrew straight up told him that he was going to rob Ron and use the money to bail his girlfriend out of jail. And when he tells them that, Mike actually didn't know that Ron had been robbed. He would have had no way of knowing that. So for him to say that seemed like a rather large coincidence. And when investigators asked even more questions about Andrew, they found out that Ron had recently kicked him out of the apartment that he rented from him. And not just that, but Andrew apparently knew that Ron was collecting rent that upcoming Saturday, making that weekend perfect time to rob him if he needed quick cash. So all of these little details added up to one thing, that Andrew Alcorns was their guy. And when they looked into his background more, they were pretty confident that he would be capable of committing a crime like this. 
Even though he didn't have a prior history of violent crimes, his criminal history was long. I'm talking 18 misdemeanor convictions, nine felonies, and several failed probation attempts. Oh, and get this. According to public court records, investigators also contacted Andrew's estranged wife, and even she said it was likely that Andrew was their guy. She said that on multiple occasions, Andrew talked about hitting a lick on Ron, which means robbing because he always carried cash on him after he collected rent, and that made him an easy target. And if Andrew's girlfriend really was in jail and really needed money to bail out, there's his motive. So at that point, tracking down Andrew Alcorns became investigators' sole mission. And if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking that investigators should start by trying to find Andrew's girlfriend in jail. And they did, but they were too late because Andrew had already bailed her out. So the story is really lining up here. And it didn't take long for investigators to track them down. It turns out that after he bailed her out of jail, Andrew and his girlfriend Paige fled three hours across state lines to Dayton, Ohio. And on April 11th, 2019, less than a week after Ron's murder, police were face to face with the guy that they believed was his killer. Well, not actually face-to-face, -face because once they located Andrew, they ended up having an 11-hour standoff with him and his girlfriend, Paige. For 11 hours, it was believed that he was holding his girlfriend hostage, and they remained inside after SWAT teams fired tear gas to try and coax them out. Obviously, they're fearful at this point that Andrew was going to kill Paige and then himself. And if that happened, then getting justice for Ron would have died along with him. But thankfully, that didn't happen because at hour 11, a loud bang was heard from inside the house. And immediately after this, Paige ran outside. Andrew had attempted to fire the gun at Paige and luckily it jammed and she was able to run free, which is great. And while having Paige in custody was good news, they needed to get to Andrew alive. And unfortunately, getting to Andrew did not go smoothly because once Paige was outside, they heard another loud bang from inside the house and they feared the worst. So the SWAT team and other officers run into the house and that's when they find that Andrew did attempt to take his own life. However, he was not successful. He had actually shot himself through the neck and survived. Police investigation led them to Dayton, Ohio where an 11-hour standoff ended in gunfire as a man they wanted to talk to about this case, Andrew Alcorns, suffered a self-inflicted gunshot wound and is now being treated at a Dayton, Ohio hospital. And while he was receiving life-saving care, they searched that house in Dayton, Ohio that he had held Paige hostage in. And investigators not only found drugs and drug paraphernalia, but they also found a gun that was an exact match to the gun that was stolen from Ron's neighbor. And after further testing was completed, they were able to determine that that gun that Andrew had attempted to take his own life with was the same gun that was used to kill Ron Wiles. And this ultimately and conclusively links him to the murder. And remember those headphones that I was telling you about earlier? The ones that were found outside of Ron's house? Well, Andrew's DNA was all over those two, which obviously tied him to the crime scene as well. His girlfriend Paige was taken into custody after the standoff, and they were able to determine that she was not involved in the murder. However, they did find out that she was the one who suggested that they borrow, keyword borrow, money from Ron to bail her out of jail. But she said she never brought up the idea to rob him and certainly never brought up the idea to kill him. And police were able to confirm that she was telling the truth because they listened to her phone calls in jail with Andrew and it happened exactly how she said it did. And so in the end, 43-year-old Andrew Alcorns was arrested and charged with felony murder, attempted felony murder, aggravated battery, arson, and robbery. And with Andrew now in custody, there was a much clearer picture in place. It was the general belief of investigators and prosecutors that on April 7th, Andrew entered the home with the intention to rob Ron. But just like investigators initially believed, things got out of hand. They believe that Ron was shot for getting in Andrew's way, which is the same reason investigators believe that Thomas got stabbed. As for the fire, I think it's hard to know whether or not that was planned. I mean, if he brought accelerant with him, I'd say he definitely planned all this. But if he found the accelerant at the house after the fact, after he had just shot and stabbed two people and panicked, Maybe he didn't have that plan from the beginning. And it hasn't been determined if he brought the accelerant with him or not. So 
We just don't know on that one. But regardless, Andrew was guilty and evidence proved it. And believe it or not, he actually accepted a plea deal. On September 14th, 2021, Andrew Alcorns pled guilty to felony murder and aggravated battery. And just two months later, he returned to the courtroom for his sentencing hearing. During this hearing, both the defense and prosecution got to make their argument for why Andrew should receive a particular sentence. For the defense, it was argued that Andrew's life had been riddled with abuse and mental health problems stemming from age three, and that his actions were in part due to his history of trauma. As for the prosecution, well, they pointed to the fact that Andrew didn't even seem to be remorseful for what he did. Apparently, after being arrested, he made a phone call to a friend where he said that he was going to blame the whole thing on his girlfriend. Not the brightest to make a call like that. Ultimately, the judge ruled with the prosecution and gave him a sentence of 75 years in prison, 60 for the felony murder charge and 15 for aggravated battery. However, because of state law, Andrew would only serve 70 of those 75 years and the remaining five would be spent on probation. Now, considering he was 43 at the time, I have a hard time believing that day will ever come anyway. That is unless he is released early, which is possible, but at that point, after serving 48 years, he will be 91 years old. So I don't see a very bright future ahead for this guy. Man has entered a guilty plea in connection to a 2019 homicide and stabbing case. Court documents state 43-year-old Andrew Alcorns is pleading guilty to felony murder and aggravated battery. Attempted murder and arson charges will be dropped at his sentencing. As part of his agreement, Alcorns will serve a minimum of 48 years in the Indiana Department of Corrections. During sentencing, many people spoke out, and one of the most important people that we heard from was Thomas, the man who was stabbed 29 times, one of Andrew's two victims. He said that he tries not to think about what happened to him, but now that Andrew has been sentenced, he can finally move on with his life. I try not to think about it, because every time I think about it, I get mad, but now I don't have to think about it anymore. I can move on my life. Now, despite pleading guilty, Andrew and his lawyers have attempted to appeal his sentence, saying that 75 years was inappropriate in light of the nature of his offenses and his character. But the court gave him a big fat no on that one and told him basically that he was lucky that he got 75 years considering what he did and his past offenses. In the end, it is nice to see that there was some justice for Ron. But it doesn't change what happened. Ron was a kind, generous, and loyal person who did absolutely nothing to deserve what happened to him. I am glad to know that Thomas now has some sort of peace knowing the person who stabbed him 29 times is behind bars. And I hope for the sake of the public that Andrew Alcorns remains behind bars for the rest of his life. And before I go today, I do want to mention that next week I'm going to be having Sarah Turney back on my show. And I'm so, so excited about it. Sarah is a good friend of mine. We have remained close since she appeared on my channel God, years ago to talk about her sister, Alyssa Turney. She was the first person I worked with when I started working with victims, family members. And as of very recently, the case has gone to trial. And I'm sure many of you have followed along. But I bring this up because when she's on next week, it's going to be a little bit different than my normal coverage. I'm bringing her on this time to pick up where we left off and to tell me about her experience since then. She's going to be opening up to us about the trial, what it's been like being in the true crime space since and starting her own podcast, Voices for Justice, as well as some of the harsh realities that she's had to face. She's going to be spilling it all. So next week, you are going to get a recap from me on the case, but I wanted to give you a heads up in case you wanted to go back and watch my older content or go check out her podcast on the case as well. That way you can remind yourself of the details of Alyssa Turney's case or introduce yourself to it if you haven't heard of it. I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be a totally different style interview, a sit-down style interview. It's going to be really cool, and I'm so excited to see Sarah again. She is a good friend of mine, and it has been way too long. And before I go, I need to thank today's sponsor, the amazing AG1, one of my favorite products on the market. And let me tell you why. Normally, I demonstrate making my AG1 using my powder canister. But today, I wanted to show you how easy it is to use their to-go packs, which I use all the time when I'm traveling or when I'm just going to the office and want to take it with me in the car. It couldn't be easier to make. You just use 8 to 10 ounces of water, add the powder right in there. And then a lot of people like to add lemon or Mio. They had suggested to me to use Mio, and that is what I use every time. Just 
the slightest bit of lemonade meal. Boop, that's it. Shake it up and you're good to go. And I am being honest when I tell you, I cannot live without AG1. I take it every single day. And I have, God, for now, I want to say since like February or earlier than that. It's been a long time. Shall we have our chug moment? Mm, I love it. That bottle I just downed includes 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. AG1 sources the best and highest quality ingredients that it can find. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, vegan, keto, and has less than one gram of naturally occurring sugar per serving. It increases my intake of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, replenishes my daily nutrients, and I just feel so much better after I take AG1. It helps me regulate my digestive system, it gives me energy, and it truly does. I skip coffee most days, and that's no lie. I've gotten several of my friends and family hooked on AG1, and no apologies there because I know it's helping them out. I really do recommend it to all of you. If you want to check it out for yourself, you can head to drinkag1.com slash Kendall Ray, and you'll get five free travel packs, these little guys, as well as a year supply of the vitamin D3 K2 drops. Thanks so much to AG1 for sponsoring my show. I love when I have sponsors that I truly love. But that is going to be it for me today, guys. I will be back next week with Sarah Turney. I am really looking forward to it. And until then, stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.